Good morning, dear Professor Travis Damsley. I'm very happy for uh, seeing uh, in person, considering the interview we have done uh, some years ago, if I'm not wrong, in uh, 2017, an interview about the link between orthodoxy and philosophy. Uh, it's a very important subject to me, considering the fact that I'm a doctor student in philosophy and I should get my PhD in philosophy as soon as possible, and I'm teaching philosophy as well as you do, because uh, I know you are, you are teaching um, at one of the greatest universities uh, from all over the world, at Concordia University in Canada, in Edmonton, uh, a university I appreciate a lot. And um, I, I'm really interested, uh, I'm uh, really interested actually in uh, this field of research, philosophy of religions, a way we can uh, better understand God from a philosophical point of view. You know what uh, does philosophy mean? Considering uh, orthodox spirituality, we are uh, thinking about uh, if I if I uh, say uh, good in English, if I, if I say well in English, uh, orthodox spirituality means uh, the right faith. So we have philosophy as the love for wisdom and orthodoxy as the um, right faith. So I take into account these two realities, these two ways of thinking, these uh, two ways of defining the world in which you are living and also reality. Uh, at the beginning of our dialogue, please tell me how do you actually understand the, um, the depth of philosophy? How should we understand philosophy in our days, considering that we are living in a very pragmatic society and philosophical standards maybe do not represent anymore something challenging and something interesting. So what could a philosophical experience mean to you? Yeah, well, uh, again, th thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk with you. And it, it's a good question. You know, how should we conceive of sort of the the task and role of philosophy uh, in in our contemporary culture? Where, yeah, as you mentioned, there, there's a lot of um, uh, cultural currents and trends that seem to um, pull away from what I would think is is the the main task of philosophy. And yeah. Uh, well, the, the way I, I talk about this uh, when I'm, I'm uh, teaching, uh, the, the definition we usually work with is that you know, philosophy is the use of rational argument to discover deep truths about reality. And so um, philosophy can be distinguished then from other fields in a couple of ways, right? It, it's, the use of, it's the use of rational argument to discover deep truths about reality. And so, um, Philosophy has a big emphasis on logic, on the use of dispassionate objective reason, uh, where the, the use of rational argument presupposes, I think, that there is an objective truth, that there is objective truth worth knowing and that we're able to know. I mean, why engage in logical discourse? Why engage in rational argument if there's no truth out there or if it's unknowable or if it's not worth knowing? So I think that the philosophical task presupposes uh, a certain conception of truth. And unfortunately, that conception of truth is under a lot of, um, is treated very skeptically in sub-segments of society and culture. Um, I think that there's a, a greater emphasis on subjectivity, a greater emphasis on, um, you know, in, in, in in Canada, there's a phrase often used that has to do with, with people speaking from their lived experience, which uh, is fine as a phrase, but it tends to have this connotation that sort of every individual has their own lived experience and it's not really communicable. And there's no way to judge the, the, the truth of the matter when there's a dispute between people about the nature of their lived experience or its implications. And I think that's unfortunate. Anyway, so that's that's one aspect I, I would say in answer to your question. I think philosophy rightly places is defined by the use of rational argument uh, and the, the place of rational argument and the importance of rational argument and objective truth needs to be emphasized and, and highlighted in our current cultural context. Again, at least in Canada, North America, the, the, the cultural situation may be somewhat different in Romania. I mean, maybe you can speak to that. Um, so yeah, the use of rational argument, and, but rational argument, not just about anything, but rational argument seeking to, 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 to clarify, discover deep truths about reality. 
uh, truths about existence, truths about value, truths about um, uh, the profound nature of things. And so philosophy, I think, is fundamentally an optimistic endeavor, right? It, it's optimistic about the use of reason, and it's optimistic about um, what's out there, what's worth knowing, and that, that trying to find the deep truths of reality is actually a worthwhile enterprise. Uh, yes, I uh, totally agree with you. Thank you for uh, having given to me such a response. Um, I have always uh, considered that philosophy represents the way by which we can better understand reality. Why do I say that? Because um, generally speaking, we are very obsessed with technology, with uh, pragmatism, with uh, different uh, social challenges, but we are not thinking uh, quite at all um, about, our, about uh, our lives, about uh, a better lifestyle and so on. Yes, we do it, but when we are thinking about a better lifestyle, we are thinking about money making, uh, we are thinking about different uh, other uh, social and political challenges, but philosophy doesn't seem to me to play um, a very significant and meaningful, meaningful role in the society in which we are living right now. Uh, as you know, uh, we are uh, testimonies of different uh, contemporary events, uh, as for example, um, this pandemic, uh, the, war, the war from Ukraine, which seems to be a great, a big uh, threatening to almost all over the world. So we have to take into account from a philosophical point of view the challenges um, uh, that are in front of us and we should react somehow, not, uh, from, not necessarily from a social point of view, but uh, especially from an ethical point of view. So considering the times in which we are living, uh, what kind of role could philosophy play and how should we uh, from a philosophical point of view, understand these contemporary realities, which are very dramatic, if I can, if I can call them like that. Do you, would you have, a as a philosopher, a response to this question? Yeah, well, um, I think in, in uh, I'll say something about this in, in very general terms and then bring it back to some of the specific examples you've, you've provided. So. In very general terms, I'd like to think that philosophy, and since we're both educators, you know, philosophical education, uh, teaching philosophy can be of value in um, exposing young people to um, a realm of ideas and concepts that they might not otherwise encounter, right? And um, plugging them in to the larger sort of global cultural heritage, you know, um, not just Greece and Rome, but you know the philosophical systems of, of other cultures as well. There's just so much richness to um, philosophical ideas uh, uh, throughout the world that uh, um, for people uh, for for people to go through a, a university degree, for instance, or even a high school program, without being exposed to any of this, I think is um, is really unfortunate and. Uh, a deprivation of a, of a person's uh, learning process if they don't get some opportunity to engage with this. So learning about um, you know, ideas about you know, different worldviews concerning you know, uh, the nature of time, the nature of the universe, did the universe have a beginning? Um, is the material cosmos all that exists or is there, there, there more to reality than that? Uh, ideas about value and knowledge, all of this is I think just intrinsically fascinating. And if it's taught in an engaging way, uh, young people do tend to um, engage with it in, in some pretty profound ways. And I expect you've noticed this with, with, with your own students, uh, the way some people really um, are profoundly impacted by, by their study of philosophy in some cases. So in very general terms, I, I think that, that that's partly what I'd say, but bringing it back to some of the interesting examples you've listed, you know, the, the, the pandemic, the ongoing war in, uh, in Ukraine. I think philosophy can also help to provide people some uh, additional resources for thinking about ethics and society, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, how people ought to live. So I, I think um, if people uh, go into these crises with a well-developed sense of right and wrong, good and evil, the foundations of uh, their own ethical ideas, I think they can more uh, rationally 
um, discuss these things and, and, and function effectively as educated, uh, engaged voters and citizens. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, that that's where I, I would highlight is some of the some of the utility of philosophy for engaging with some of this. Yes, a very interesting philosophical perspective. Uh, now, um, when I'm talking about philosophy, uh, maybe I have developed a, a certain obsession regarding metaphysics, probably because of the fact that I have studied a lot Heidegger during my uh, uh, during my uh, philosophical years as a faculty of philosophy from Bucharest. And um, yes, there is a certain uh, interest um, according to Heidegger's philosophy. Um, and from this point of view, I can I could take into account uh, his work, uh, Being and Time, in which he has trying to highlight the dimension of being, of what could uh, human being mean, and generally speaking, being itself. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to give a definition to, to being and to explain the role and the essence, uh, the essence of being uh, from this point of view, um, uh, Greek philosophers um, have given a try, and, uh, but I don't know if they managed to explain and to make us understand the significance uh, of being, uh, generally speaking, as an entire if I can call it like that. So it's very difficult from, um, for, any, uh, for any single philosopher to give a definition from this point of view. I could say being is everything, as Thales uh, has said uh, many, many years ago, no? because uh, we are talking about an ancient philosopher. In 20th century, Heidegger tries to explain the meaning of being according to different um, characteristics. Uh, and uh, the most important characteristic that he finds is actually metaphysics, but uh, even Heidegger says that metaphysics uh, has died from a long time, uh, for, uh, for a long time ago because the West has gave up on metaphysics, and even Hegel was the first one who um, has a representative, who has been the representative uh, of the death of metaphysics. I, I don't know if uh, we should judge him uh, in, uh, in this paradigm, in this light. I shouldn't say, I couldn't say that he was the first one who destroyed metaphysics in the West. But anyway, we could say that um, um, uh, from 50s, from 60s, beginning with 60s, uh, especially, metaphysics in philosophy ceased to exist. And uh, uh, we are talking actually about what we can call ontotheology. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me, maybe you have uh, another opinion from this point of view, but my question to you is very simple. Why should we uh, say that uh, there is no metaphysics right now in philosophy? And on the other hand, could we say, would we have the right to say that metaphysics is actually the main characteristic of a true philosophy? Yeah, well, maybe just uh, just to give your viewers uh, a little bit of additional background who might not be familiar with some of this history. So, um, so, for, so metaphysics is, is one way of, of, of defining it. This is controversial, but one way of defining it is just the, the, the subdiscipline of philosophy that focuses on the nature and existence of things. You know, what sorts of things exist? What is existence itself? You know, what is being? Uh, what are the most general categories of being, uh, et cetera. And as you rightly pointed out, there was an extended period in uh, Western philosophy, especially philosophy in the English speaking world, where metaphysics, this particular subdiscipline of philosophy had a very low uh, status. It, it was held in very low regard. It was widely viewed as just being an impossible and therefore worthless sort of uh, endeavor. So there was an intellectual movement in, in England and America in, in particular called logical positivism uh, that your, your, your viewers may or may not have heard of, but the, the basic idea of, of logical positivism is that, um, or one idea associated with logical positivism is that all of our knowledge ultimately has to come through the five senses. And so there, the, we can, uh, no, the realm of knowledge and meaning is restricted to what we can know through the five, through empirical observation, right, through the five senses. And so because traditionally metaphysics was interested in questions about the transcendent, in questions that could not be decided 
by use of you know scientific methods, you know, experimentation and observation. Um, the logical positivists felt that metaphysics was impossible and therefore worthless. We just can't know anything about, you know, if there is anything non-physical, we can't know anything about it. And trying to talk about it just leaves us in talking in, in fundamentally meaningless uh, circles. So that was a big intellectual movement. And you're right that um, uh, right up through the early 1960s, especially again in the English speaking world, uh, positivism ha had enormous influence. Thankfully, that started to uh, reverse itself in the 1960s, and traditional metaphysics started to make a comeback in the English-speaking world. And as an extension of that, philosophy of religion, philosophical theology also started to um, be a, talk, uh, a topic of interest again. And so in the last uh, 50, 60 years, there's been a big revival of uh, interest in metaphysics and philosophy of religion in the English speaking philosophical world. Uh, and so today in, in, in North America, you know, you, you can easily do a, a PhD in analytic metaphysics and you can write about these traditional questions about, you know, time and God and matter and, and uh, whether matter is all that exists. All these questions are back on the table as, act, uh, as topics of active discussion. Now, I don't know if that's the case to the same degree in um, non-English speaking philosophy. So I, I don't know if that's the, the, the case to a, a large a degree in, in France or in Germany or in Romania, Russia. Um, I know that in, in those countries, you know, what, what's termed continental philosophy is often uh, uh, pretty influential. And I just, my knowledge of continental philosophy is pretty poor. So when I talk about the revival of metaphysics, I'm really talking about the revival of metaphysics in, in analytic philosophy. Maybe you could say something about the, the current state of metaphysics in, uh, in Europe or you know, the, the non-English speaking part of the world. There is not uh, such a huge interest in uh, metaphysics in Europe, uh, but uh, there is an exception, Italy, from this point of view, because Italy has developed a certain uh, interest for philosophy of religion. And I know very well Italy because I'm getting involved in different um, projects of research, considering philosophy of religion in, in uh, uh, Italy, and I'm also a member of uh, um, Italian uh, Academy of Philosophy of Religions, and there is a huge interest for uh, a metaphysical way of explaining God's existence. And from this point of view, I could give you a very interesting example, Pier Francesco Stagi, uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of his works uh, has been translated into English, and I will do all my best uh, uh, to, to send you a copy of his book where he's uh, trying to explain why metaphysics is still and will always be the main characteristic of a real philosophy. He says we cannot do any kind of philosophy if we are not engaged in metaphysics because metaphysics is the best way to explain God's reality and God's reality uh, could only be a philosophical way, uh, way of being, of creating reality. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting explanation coming from a philosopher, coming uh, from a contemporary philosopher. And yes, um, if you ask me, I'm very, um, I'm convinced that metaphysics uh, uh, is actually the main way by which uh, we cannot only explain the reality or God's creation or something like that, but even human nature. Because yes, we can define a human being from an ontological point of view. But nevertheless, metaphysics represents actually the way by which we can discover, we can better discover the depth of human being. This is my personal point of view. Uh, now, now, if you permit me, I would be very interested to discuss a little bit this link between orthodox spirituality and philosophy. I know uh, orthodoxy plays a very important role in your, in your philosophical researches, and uh, I really appreciate you for the fact that uh, you have published an article, uh, a scientific article uh, in a book uh, coordinated by our, our common friend, uh, I mean, uh, Rikovic, his books, uh, Turning East, uh, his book, 
Turning East uh, was translated, has been translated in Romanian as well, and uh, it uh, was very successful in our country. And not only uh, in our country, even in uh, non-Orthodox countries, especially in Catholic countries, as for example, in Poland, or uh, I can, uh, if I'm not wrong, even in uh, Italy, because uh, there are um, many ways of perceiving, perceiving from a philosophical, from a philosophical point of view, not only Orthodox theology, but but also contemporary society. And uh, you have published a very, a very important uh, article about your conversion to Orthodox spirituality and also about uh, your philosophical view. There are um, uh, some other American philosophers, uh, as for example, Jonathan Jacobs, or uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, even Richard Ote, philosophers uh, who I know very well. And I repeat, I really appreciate your way of viewing. Of viewing. At the beginning of uh, our dialogue, I have been trying to emphasize a little bit the link, uh, the significance, the definition of philosophy and also of orthodox theology. I don't want to repeat them anymore. But uh, from your point of view, as a philosopher and a very important philosopher, because uh, it is very well known that you are a very appreciated philosopher, not only in Canada, but generally in the English, in the English speaking world, what kind of link could we find between orthodox spirituality and uh, philosophy? And on the other hand, could we talk about uh, any kind of orthodox philosophy? Sure. So I think there are deep links between uh, philosophy and orthodox spirituality, and we see this in the history of the church. So if we go back and and read some of the, the, the great early uh, church fathers, you know, people like um, Clement of Alexandria or um, Gregory of Nyssa, um, uh, uh, St. Dionysius uh, the Areopagite. Um, all these figures were, were, were uh, deeply educated in the philosophical systems of their day. Um, systems like, like Stoicism, uh, Neoplatonism, you know, they knew the philosophical literature and they knew it well. And, uh, and they found ways of, in some cases, uh, very surprising and sophisticated ways of trying to integrate legitimate insights from those often pagan uh, systems, trying to, to figure out you know, what was true in them, what was false in them, what could be integrated into a Christian uh, vision of reality and what needed to be rejected. And so uh, just go back to, to uh, uh, St. Dionysius uh, for a moment. He's a particularly uh, fascinating example of this, I think, in, in that it's well known that he was uh, deeply influenced by the, the one of the last great pagan philosophers, uh, Proclus. And Proclus was not just a pagan, but um, deeply opposed to Christianity. And uh, he constructed his philosophical system in, in part as a way of, of trying to disprove Christianity. And so you might think that, um, so if, if, I'm just, if I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, how does, what's the stereotypical um, view of Christian intellectual history if you're thinking about it from the perspective of a contemporary atheist or a secularist? Um, I think the stereotypical view of Christian intellectual history would be closed-mindedness, um, ins insularity. Uh, but really, that's not what we find. And, and again, what, what Dionysius did was uh, he, he became deeply well acquainted with Proclus's pagan anti-Christian system. Uh, and he reworked it and he figured out what was legitimate in that system, what was actually compatible with Christianity, what might actually shed light on the Christian worldview. And so he accepted what was legitimate, rejected what wasn't, and was very open-minded to, to learning from uh, you know, non-Christian pagan culture. And, uh, and you see this through, uh, often in, in early patristic figures, uh, the, this openness and this confidence Right. Uh, if you're confident in your own um, faith, you don't need to fear having to engage with these uh, other competing uh, worldviews and systems. And so this is what we see in early Christian philosophy, this confidence in the faith and the ability of the faith to integrate any kind of, of actual truth 
into a coherent Christian worldview. And I think that's how Orthodox philosophers today should still operate. We should be open and willing to learn from anyone who's got um, truthful, legitimate insights. Because anything that's true can fit into an Orthodox worldview. And we should be willing to engage openly with um, anybody, knowing that the Orthodox faith uh, has the fullness of truth, um, but that we, we can always be willing to gain further insights uh, from others. And moreover, this is, a, this is an important part of evangelism, right? If we want to be able to um, um, engage productively with non-Christian and non-Orthodox philosophers and theologians and scholars, um, we need to do this, I think, in a way that, that's open to legitimate dialogue, where we recognize that they have insights that we're willing to learn from, um, and so that it's not simply a, a, a one-way uh, enterprise or endeavor. I think that tends to be unproductive. Anyway, so uh, hopefully that, that touches on some of the, some of the points you were, you were um, looking for. Sure, thank you very much. Um, considering, considering you are uh, an author of philosopher, I uh, would have, uh, if I can call it like that, uh, a small metaphysical curiosity. Uh, since you have become, uh, since you have become an orthodox believer, how do you perceive actually philosophy itself right now, in an orthodox light? Um, well, I think my my basic perspective on philosophy has has remained unchanged. That that, that it is this. Um, it is this optimistic quest to use logic and reason to dive into you know, profound truths about the nature of reality. Maybe that comes back to your, your notion that metaphysics is really at the foundation of philosophy. Uh, it's this, this quest for discovering deep and significant truths about uh, reality, meaning, value. Uh, and I think you know, for me, uh, orthodoxy is... is um, a sort of extension and fulfillment of this, right? You've got um, the revelation uh, uh, communicated to us through the church to uh, assist us in this philosophical enterprise and to um, you know, point the way to some areas of inquiry that, that you know, a secular philosopher might, might not otherwise be aware of or interested in. So I think the church can uh, assist and guide uh, the philosophical enterprise in, in a really productive way. In other words, I, I don't think that I don't think that philosophy and the church are in any kind of opposition or uh, a, a confrontational stance. I, I think that they, they they can work together in this uh, quest for better understanding uh, reality and, and, and teaching about it. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are almost uh, at the end of our dialogue, but uh, I would have one more question, one last question, a very brief one. Um, let's say we could talk about an author's philosophy, which will become more and more well known, even in the English speaking world. Um, tell me, please, how actually could an author's philosoph philosophy could could be a possibility for an opportunity for uh, philosophy to be better discovered in our days in which uh, philosophy itself is rejected. And on the other hand, could we say that orthodox philosophy could be a salvation for metaphysics or rebirth of metaphysics in different um, academic approaches of our days? Yeah, well, um... To, to start with, 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 with your last point there about, you know, what can, what can orthodoxy do to um, assist in the revival of metaphysics or, or the, 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 the um, taking philosophy seriously again in parts of the world or in parts of the culture where, where it's not? Well, one insight I think that, that orthodoxy has that, that can be especially useful here. So I mentioned uh, at, the, at the beginning of our discussion that 
there is this overemphasis, at least in North American culture, on um, personal experience as sort of the ultimate source of, of, of truth and, and, and at least subjective truth and validity, right? That people need to look to their own lived experience to figure out what's true and what, what's right, what's good. Um, and at first glance, it might seem as if orthodoxy is opposed to this, right? Because we, we have this great emphasis on reason and logic and the authority of the church and the Bible uh, in, in assisting us in our inquiries. But in fact, I think this actually works together, right? Or, the orthodox tradition, one of the strengths of the orthodox tradition is this um, profound history of um, experiential knowledge, right? Especially uh, from our... Um, monastic um, uh, fathers and mothers, right? Teaching us about how to uh, reach out to God and uh, in an experiential way, right? The hesychastic tradition uh, uh, that, that's still taught on in places like Mount Athos. Um, so seeking God, yes, through reason, yes, through the revelation communicated through the church, but also through personal experience. This too is an aspect of Orthodox spirituality. And this is something in particular, I think, can be can really speak to people caught up in this current cultural moment where there is an overemphasis on personal experience, right? That, that this can, in fact, be a kind of bridge to orthodoxy and to right philosophy, right? Because there is this emphasis on, yes, there is a legitimacy to seeking truth through personal experience, but there are better and but there are more or less effective ways of doing this. And the Orthodox tradition can provide you with some effective ways of seeking truth experientially. Dear, uh, dear Professor uh, Travis Damse, dear friend, it, uh, it's been a real pleasure for me having this dialogue with you. Thank you very much for uh, the depth of your answers. I congratulate you for everything you are doing at the university and uh, also as a contemporary philosopher. And uh, I really want to tell you in, in a public context that you, are, that you are a real philosophical model to me. And I have learned a lot, a lot of things uh, reading your articles and uh, hearing about your uh, conversion to Orthodox spirituality. Thank you very much. And uh, I really hope we can uh, meet in the future as well. And uh, we will be able to develop a philosophical collaboration. Thank you a lot uh, again. You're welcome. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Goodbye.